I need some music. Hello, hello, hello. Can everyone hear me? Does the background music need to be quieter? It feels like it does on my end, personally, but... I'll bring the background music down just a tad. Because it is quite loud for me and I don't know why. Okay. i just turn the background music down just for me. Gotta say, uh, Spree, I don't know if he's in the chat, but he introduced me to voice meter, and it's really helpful for managing all of this stuff so you guys can hear me fine, but I don't get blasted with background music. Anyways, so yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna be doing some maps, some drawing. I'm unfortunately having regular camera issues, so you guys get to see my extremely messy office instead of just the cool bookshelf part. I'm also going to leave the door open because uh, we might have cats visit, like here. Say hi to Wit, the fluffiest boy. Hey, buddy. Kitty. But yeah, we're going to be just uh, drawing some maps in sort of my own weird way. Uh, it's going to be a lot of painting. Uh, I have some sketches of the map I'm going to be doing, and it's going to be for the one shot this week. That's, uh. Yeah, I don't know that the camera will be good enough for you to see the one shot as I'm imagining it, but that will be fine. Because hopefully by the end of this, you will all be able to actually see. Uh, basically this. The erstwhile Isles. I just like the name, and it is kind of like a transient uh, place. There's not a lot of permanent residents. A lot of people stop by there is kind of the background. And we'll talk more about this setting and where it comes from and all of that, because I have way more lore than we're going to get into for the one-shot for this thing. So... 
Now we're going to see if I have... I'm just finishing setting up the drawing box, basically. Uh, let's add an image. Hmm. Also, one of these times, y'all are going to have to show me how to crop stuff, because right now you get to see my whole uh, Photoshop window instead of just the parts I want you to see. So you'll see me fiddling around with tools maybe more than we need to, but you know, that's fine. All right. All right, all right, all right. Uh, and yeah, you're not going to get to see my face while doing the art. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to see the art and my face at the same time uh, because I'm having camera problems. But maybe the next time we do this, uh, you'll be able to see at least a little bit of me and cat. Uh, heck, next time, maybe I just point the camera at the cats. We'll have to see. Alright, so let's transition. Get out of here. Everyone still hear me alright? I hope so. arranging my screen so I can still see chat while I do this. Yep, sorry, no more cat. If I could, the cat would still be on. But you guys can't see, but this computer basically bends itself all the way down so that it's actually a good drawing surface. That's a whole thing it does. So, because this is an island, I'm going to try and find just a real good shade of blue first and just dump that all over the background. Now let's see, we can add in some green later. do this. The simplest way is to just hold background this, because that's going to be the base of this piece. And uh, Fun fact, the thing I almost never remember to do is to make sure I have multiple layers. So let's make a sketch layer here. because it's going to make it easier for me. Let's... Now it looks like I've just undone my work, but... Ta-da! So yeah, 
let's find a good color to sketch with. Now I know what colors are going to be in this. It's going to be stuff like browns and greens and blues. So what I think I will do for a sketch color is uh, let's do a bright red. That's going to help if I just lower this opacity a bit. Put it 70. And so yeah, I know what the shape this island is supposed to be. So if we just take a... Oh, come on, don't do that to me. No, let's not do a pen tool. Let's do... Let's do a pencil tool. Probably should be a bit t bigger than one pixel, though. I'm using a pretty big uh, canvas. It's uh, always easier to downsample and all that, so let's see what this looks like here. Okay. Okay, okay. So, right. so the shape of this island, if you noticed, was kind of like one, one big bean, one big bean. Well, let's, let's redo that curve there. Big bean, and I haven't been like super super specific with the shape of this in the past. The important part is sort of a narrow land bridge looking thing. And we don't have to worry about it not being super realistic quite yet. Uh, let's, let's give it a little less space down here. So this, uh, this island I'm making for this one shot, uh, it actually made for a home game first. It was a sort of, it was a sort of fun, like, seat of your pants experiment where I did make some world lore to start with, but really what I did was ask my players what they wanted to play. Like I drew a map and said, here's some where the basic stuff is. And all these players were brand new players. I'm like, hey, what kind of character do you want to play? And then after they told me what they wanted to play, and I asked them, what is that culture like? Uh, that's when I actually finished building the world. Let's, let's actually erase some of this work I've just done, because I realized this is not exactly how I want it laid out. Uh, but no, so I think there was some very fun stuff that came out of that idea. I had one player who wanted to play a Furbolg Druid, but the way he described, like, Furbolgs was very much not the way that they're described in uh, actual D&D canon. He made them sound like they were like noble Scottish uh, clansmen who... Or, no, that's a bad word to use for that. Uh, they were these like noble Scottish thing. Uh, an isthmus purple? What does that mean? Is that the thing I'm describing? Uh, anyways, there's like these very uh, noble warriors that had rotating families of who was in charge, and they had like very kilts. Yeah, damn for Volga, they ruined for Volga. Yeah, but it was more like before, you know, England came in and wrecked all their shit. It was very. Uh... Oh, a land bridge. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, this land bridge. We'll get to it in a second. But still, the world building. It was very fun to do, and uh, this campaign went on for like almost three years, actually. And uh, it only recently ended. I took the players from level 3 to level 100. Uh, fun time was had by all. Uh, but because sometimes people couldn't make it, and it was a group of 6, so some people... Oh, sorry, 20. Bleh. Level 20. Purple keeping me honest. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, level 20. Uh, but no, because, you know, there were six people, which was a lot, and I mean a lot of people, oh boy, 
Uh, I don't think I will do that ever on stream because it'd be hard to manage. Uh, but because people couldn't make it, I did a lot of one-shots that were set in the universe where I uh, made characters for my players usually because they were all kinda new. Uh, and uh, I just took them to another place in the world and said, hey, this is an event that happened. Uh, this is how we deal with that event. Or tell me how you deal with that event more accurately. It was uh, fun to do, and this was one of them, the erstwhile Isles. And uh, I had a very specific concept for this. Uh, the players already know this concept, so it's not going to cause them to metagame too much, and I don't know that any of them are here anyways. But, uh... Remember, remember uh, the zombies-type game in uh, Call of Duty? A six-person game, yeah, it's, it's very big. Oh, ten players? Oh, you have to cancel it. That's way too much. At that point, you almost need to split into two games there, Purple. Like, ugh. Now I could barely manage six. It only worked because one of the players is a sibling of mine who was very good at mechanics and stuff, so I could lean on them a lot. And the rest of them were so new that none of them had bad habits. Hmm. But yeah, this. This is, uh, if you remember the zombie game type in Call of Duty games, uh, where it's like you just survive wave after wave after wave. I wanted that, but I wanted it to make sense. Like, there had to be a reason for it. And, uh... Eh. Yeah, yeah, Purple, if uh, everyone wants to hang out, but no one really wants to plan anything, then, uh, you need to do a board game night. You can't... Don't do D&D. &D. Don't do D&D. &D. Do a board game night. Do a series of board game nights, but don't... Yeah, no, you got suckered into preparing things for people who didn't actually want to prepare. They say they wanted you to prepare D&D, &D, but I'm telling you, uh, nope. That's not what they want. Anyways, let's make... Let's make some docks here. I'm just gonna... Actually, let's... Yeah, no purple, I'd, I'd be doing that too. Honestly, at a certain point you're like, nah, guys, I can't be made to do all this work if no one's going to actually try and appreciate it. Even the Dungeon Master has got to look out for themselves and their own mental health. They're not there to serve everyone else's whims. No, I get that. I get that purple. But anyways, the uh, the setting, this thing. So yeah, this is a small island, and the whole point that I was doing, and I'll be drawing some of those details in a second, is uh, there's all these very sharp, jagged rocks. A lot of these edges are cliffs. So there's a lot of just difficult to explain, maybe, uh, maybe uh, magical even tides that this land bridge in the middle, this isthmus, uh, I didn't say that right, uh, periodically, like once every half hour, just completely flooded for a period of time. I'm not going to be too specific on that, and maybe it's not even ha every half hour, but just so over flooded that you can't stand on it. So people who need it, want to cross it have to time it very specifically, like extremely so. Uh, that ends up being the way that you, the way that I justified at least waves of zombies, that if they're all coming from the top up here, uh, the top north part, uh, down through the land bridge, then uh, they can only make it every so often. Uh, that gives players that sort of breathing period in the middle between waves to do things. And I do want them to be doing stuff, like there's definitely going to be uh, secrets to find, there's going to be resources that you can get. Uh, I thought it was a very fun sort of concept. And uh, yeah, the hardest part is going to be, or has been in the past, uh, balancing those waves so they're not dead instantly, but they don't uh, defeat them easily. You know, it's the perpetual problem of any D&D &D game. It's so focused on big hits do big numbers that you don't really... Uh, what's what I'm looking for? You don't really have solid math on this is balanced. The game says it does, but in my experience, it's never remotely as difficult as you think it will be.
Mm hmm. No, and I, I didn't mind the it's difficult to kill a player thing for a big story campaign that I was running with a bunch of new guys where I'm like, I don't want to kill their first character, that'd be kind of mean. I wasn't avoiding killing them, but I didn't want to do it on purpose. So, you know, it was fine for that. Uh, but for something like this, I was like, ah, man, what is the right number of zombies that will be easy for me to handle, because I can't handle 50 tokens at a time, but will also be uh, challenging for them. Hmm. All right, chat, let's see here. A fun fact about lighthouses, which... This is going to be a big lighthouse here. But lighthouses actually have two lights, so that people know the direction to enter from. Uh, if you just saw one light in the dark, and you went towards it, say you were coming from the, the top bit here, and you went towards it, you'd run into rocks, or not dock. There has to be a light on top, and there has to be one just below it. And then you line those up, you go towards it. I didn't really know that until I was much too old to mention. Uh, I think it's a fun little detail about, I don't know, how they actually function, why they exist to help keep people safe. Uh, the problem I am going to run into now is... Where do I build the town around it? The original sketch is slightly different shape, so now I'm going to have to improv some. Well, one thing I wanted was a main road sort of goes in this way. Whoop, that's way too wide. Sort of goes in this way. And it just kind of tails off there as it gets to this not always there sandy land bridge. Uh, and just the way towns end up being, there's going to be another sort of central road that goes through there. It's not a big town, so then we'll just have one more road. This is maybe my Utah sensibilities, but we're quite good at having grid-based cities over here. So I tend to plan my cities out in a similarly practical fashion. Props to Dan, by the way, for uh, coming up with this, playing this playlist. This is actually pretty good chill music. And just for a little bit of impracticality, there's going to be just one more odd road there, let's say. And uh, I'm just going to come up with some buildings. The plan is that the players won't actually make it to this northern side, but the motto of any Boy Scout and the should be motto of any DM is to always be prepared. So I'm going to plan it out and I will make a simplified map. It's not really I'll make a simplified map of uh, this area basically so that the players, if they decide to brave, endless hordes from all directions, instead of a much more manageable set of directions, uh, they can. They can go do that. I'm not going to tell them not to not to do something crazy. Some of the funnest stuff in D&D is when players decide to do something crazy. Really, I think that the role of any DM should be to say yes if you roll for it. Whatever rule you need to come up with, whatever mechanic you need to faff about and justify, whatever you gotta do, the point is to say, yeah, roll for it. Alrighty. This is sort of the sketch phase that normally I kinda go through quicker than this. But, you know, plenty to take your time sometimes. I 
Hey, Ellie. Oh, you missed the part where you could see my cat. You missed that part. Here, I'm going to give Ollie if she's still around. Very quick. Cat. Bye, buddy. Good cool boy. He likes to nap. He likes to nap right behind me when I'm doing any computer stuff. Anyways, back to drawing time. Hopefully, Ollie didn't just say lurk and then close the window. Alrighty. Now we're just gonna faff about a bit with the buildings over here. Anyways, this uh, setting that I ended up coming up with with my players uh, was quite fun because it was extremely not human-centric. It was a... Uh, here, I almost want to just draw it really quick. There was kind of like something like this going on. I ended up feeling vaguely America-esque, but then it had just like an extra continent over here. And there's another continent on the other side. And like, humans who had a nation they'd only recently built were like, that. That was it. And uh, the rest of the world was mostly not humans. And I think I had a very good time just being like, look, there's just so many different kinds of people. And I tried to like make each of them just different than the way that they were originally in the book, or I let the players sort of dictate what they were. And since they were all new, none of them really came up with something that was too similar. The uh, one who picked an ASMR is like, yeah, but can an elf have a child that's an ASMR? I'm like, yes, they could. Let's roll with that. Uh, and so we kind of mixed those uh, stat blocks together. Uh, one who wanted to be a half elf uh, wanted to be a storm sorcerer. And so I kind of whittled together a uh, storm elf uh, sub race that I thought was really fun. That I kind of almost made godly. And uh, when all was said and done, there was just... No one picked anything like religious or clerical, and so I kind of ran with this idea I've had of uh, a world without many gods. I called it the God Forsaken Land, which I thought was a fun, uh, just, I don't know, a fun phrase for it, a fun saying. And it ended up being... It ended up being a fun campaign. At least, it was fun for me. I hope my players enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, the main idea was that, like, this world was made by a war between gods. Uh, that, like, these gods made a new world just to fight in it, and just through them exerting power, end up accidentally making all the same races, all the same peoples that they did before, just remixed a little. And, uh, through sort of those... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Yes, through those battles, they leave these huge, sort of, magical scars on the world. And these magical scars are what people actually end up worshipping, because the gods eventually just sort of go away. They don't stick around, they decide, you know, we've done enough damage here. It's only much later for the campaign that the players are confronted with Maybe not all the gods left, that some of them sort of tricked or conjoled or uh, weaseled their way back into the world, and at least one or two of them are not a nice and friendly god that you would want to have in your world. It was, uh... I reused Lolth. I didn't really use Drow, though. I mean, I think I used Deep Elves still, but they were not the ones under Lolth. Uh, I really made her a god that could just make creatures, and that those creatures, when they do attain sentience, attempt to leave. I tried to make a lot more of a nuanced, like, villainous thing. Uh, I ended up really using the Underdark a whole lot more than I thought I was going to, but my players kept on kind of being like, I don't know, what's underground here? Uh, 
Uh, I think one of the funnier things that happened was uh, one of the players wasn't going to be there for the first session, but I wanted to do the first session, and that player was going to be a rogue, a dragonborn rogue. So I uh, gave the players a one-time companion who could open locks uh, that was just supposed to be for that first session that was a kobold rogue named Finty. Uh, uh, Finty the... Uh, what was his background? The folk hero. And uh, yeah, I just I made him a thief, and he was like a third of their level, or two-thirds, and the only thing he was good at was lockpicking. Like, that was it. Lockpicking and stealth. I specifically made him not good at combat, which is the secret to, like, a uh, DM NPC. Uh, unfortunately, they loved Finty to fucking death and adopted him immediately, so even though they had a big rogue who was a blue dragonborn, they also had a blue kobold who uh, was just a technically less effective version of him. Uh, and they loved him. It ended up being a whole thing of, like, the world wasn't sure as if Kriv the Dragonborn and Finty the Kobold were two separate people. That he was just very good at disguises and changing his shape and size. It was kind of a good bit by the time it was all said and done. All right, let's. All right, I just need to block in some of these buildings because this is not going to be. I'm not going to keep these shapes I'm doing right here. These very wiggly, uh, unruly shapes. So it's going to be fine. It's gonna be fine. Uh, you know, sometimes that uh, world building and sometimes your players pick someone that you didn't think that they were gonna care about, and it ends up being really fun. Uh, I ended up pulling out a lot more backstory for Finty, and that was part of the reason they went to the Underdark so much, is I made Kobolds sort of a... I don't know, a uh, culture of people who are trying to avoid making any waves, trying to avoid being too uh, being too obvious, and I actually made them like extremely good at uh, tunneling and building uh, systems that like handled water, and they actually uh, in the human nation especially ended up being the ones that sort of build all of the uh, plumbing infrastructure, and in return they get to build a whole other city underneath human cities, and be basically unbothered. Uh, by having a job, uh, they don't have to live in caves and be attacked by adventurers all the time. Uh, and so yeah, I got to develop just like a whole culture of them. Uh, I think I made them a, a democratic monarchy or something to that effect. Uh, I, I, I have these all written down, and I think the bit was that like they have a ruling family, but literally any time that uh, any of like a council of people who run the city decide to, they can uh, basically be like, okay, new royalty, and then uh, kick them out. But you know, it could last for like a few generations before that happened, but generally, basically every generation, it's like, oh yeah, we liked your dad, but we don't like you, or we liked your mom or wife or whatever. We don't like you, you're not as good at this, so uh, go away. Just add a few more details. So I don't know what stream Foxy is in right now, but he needs to tell me more about his character he's doing for the one shot. All I know is he's playing a druid, probably, but he keeps saying, ah, oh, well, what if I play some other thing? And, uh, I don't know. I have no idea where a druid lives on this island, but maybe he's just visiting. There's definitely going to be some, uh, ships in the harbor. This is not the map they're moving around on, by the way. This is just me getting a feel for an overland map so that I can uh, have players reference it. I can jump back to it and be like, this is it here. If you've seen if you've seen any of uh, our Night City game, our cyberpunk game, you'll know what I mean. I do that a lot of... Yep, here's the big map because I don't want to have to draw every single freaking building, but players also do need to know 
like the geography of the place they're in, I find is way more important than people think it is. I'm gonna say that's Smooth Beach. And this is. Nah, actually, we're gonna make all that Smooth Beach. I think it's craggy about here. That's gonna be cliffs. I'm just doing this real quick. This will just help me have a sense of where I'm going to put light, lighter and darker grays later to sort of indicate cliff. Mm. In a similar way. Ta-da. So yeah, this island... Man, maybe I shouldn't have erased the map, because I do like to talk about this. Uh, this island is... I'm just going to do this very quick. This island is at this point... Over here... The island is right there. And uh, the sort of history and setting of this island specifically is uh, down in this area are the uh, Yanti, which instead of being a race specifically, I made more like a uh, religion and a culture that just once you join this religion, uh, you go through a ritual to become a snake being. But like any race can do that. So they definitely have like snake looking minotaur types. Uh, it's just uh, many generations in or if you are very important in the culture that you get turned into like a one of the weird snake abomination things. Uh, but I also very much secretly, but not so secretly, uh, just made him like a real big cult. And I even had some really fun sort of like magical brainwashing stuff that I pulled from some other games that I really liked so that uh, they did have rebellions. They did have people who separated themselves from the culture. Uh, but the dominant force of this nation was uh, basically brainwashing everyone into being like, oh, yep, we're the best. We should uh, convert people by force. Low-key, maybe my uh, opinions on religion bled into this, I don't know. Anyways, uh, they are at war with... Oop. They are at war with everybody, but especially the continent to the north and the people to the south. To the north, uh, I have the Humblewood book, which is really good, and I just kind of put them, like, up here. And then I had uh, an orc nation here, these two fighting together from this side. And over here were the uh, Pena, uh, bee folk, as well as some other insectoids that were uh, generally good if isolationists. They were uh, tried to be just and fair. And so for this island, it is the only really good resupply point for any ship going this way. Because uh, there's also, you know, some other island continent type stuff down here. So a ex skill, uh, experienced captain would stop there to resupply because this whole isthmus, this land bridge, is uh, just always at war. The uh, Pena try to stay out of it, the bee folk, and uh, they're actually the ones that founded this island. The base here is an Apenya base, and the Apenya are known for their airships. Uh, their airships are... Uh, pretty lightweight, but the Pena are small creatures, and they're bees. They're not exactly heavy hitters. Whoop. That is not what I wanted to do. I hit the wrong button. And uh, So, you know, they could carry all this stuff into what seemed like a island that was impossible to... Hey, learner. Yeah, so I think there's probably a tension between these insectoids here, the Apenya, that are, I don't know, that I would say inhuman. They are still an intelligent species, but they're definitely, they're definitely farther from human, you would say. I think I uh, gave them a uh, very organized culture and one that uh, had very complex ideas about uh, gender and royalty and all that. 
Something I like to do with fantasy races, and especially ones that are very far from human, is think about little things like how would they process the same things that we try and process all the time. Like, I mean, bees, as far as I know, would have more than one idea of gender, because you have like a queen, you have uh, like male fighter drones, and then you have workers. So three, I think is what I said. And also, you know, they are definitely, their culture would be built, and I don't know about, I don't like the idea of they're biologically built in some way, but their culture would be built to say, hey, no, it's better to uh, serve a greater whole and uh, serve a community. And so for the humans, especially they're very individualistic, they would seem uh, alien in their devotion. Uh, so, you know, even if they set up this island, I think that a lot of the other races would be eh about uh, working with them, but would be happy to have a place to live that, you know, gets a good amount of trade and is kind of out of the way. There's always some people who are ready to start a new life. So, I think it being this place with a lot of trade, I would also make it extremely diverse in the various races that are there. Like, I don't know. I always assume there'd be like 50 people living here, maybe. Uh, and just a lot of inns and places for sailors to stay. And of that, let's say 50, maybe five. Maybe five to seven of them would be human. It would be a lot more orcs, a lot more bird folk, a lot of the insect folk. And then, you know, I think I still had various races that weren't interested culturally in, like, building a, uh, what's the word? In building a nation, so they kind of just are everywhere. Uh, you know, halflings, gnomes, uh, goblins, things like that. But, yeah. Anyways, let's, let's get to... Little more cliffy cliff stuff here. Alright. So yeah, this uh, fortress placement, I think I flavored it as almost like a research place. It's one of the farthest uh, buildings the Impenia, Impenia make to the north. Eh. I am having a good stream, Lerner. And yeah, don't don't sweat the misspelling. I get that like all the time, like all the time. It's a uh, it's actually funny. It's a pretty good way of catching uh, telemarketers. Uh, some of our viewers may not know that uh, Tate is not my first name. It's my middle name. So you know, if someone calls me by my first name or doesn't get my middle name quite right, and I'm like, yeah, you probably don't actually know me. We just need to. So we're gonna place some pretty big boulders around here. I'm thinking sharp, sharp, jagged rocks. Oh, come on. Hmm. It is very sneaky. Yeah, thank you, Learner. All right. Yeah, we're gonna. Okay, what's the pen doing? There we go. It always feels like to me that digital pens crap out on me more often than uh, physical ones. But then I remember that I have a billion pencils and I probably just rotate through them so constantly that I never need to... Uh, I never need to use one super often where I only have one digital pen. Excuse me, guys, if this is a less exciting part of the stream as I'm just sketching this out, but... Oh, when it comes to good... Any kind of good digital art especially, but in my opinion, any art... Uh, planning it out first is extremely helpful. 
just gonna just gonna have a better idea of where you're going. You know, uh, make decisions with an end goal in mind instead of just willy-nilly. Yeah, let's have more building here. Actually, I think that's an empty space that could use a little more, a little more oomph. Alright, anyways. A few more rocks. I'm just gonna keep blabbing about the setting while I do this because I had quite a lot of fun making it. Uh, I had this idea that these uh, scars that gods left on the world before they left uh, would be these like magical phenomena no one can really explain. And the first one I came up with was something I called Thoron's Trench. I made the uh, main human god somewhere between Odin and Thor. And uh, the idea I had is that it would just be this massive cut into the side of the planet. Just this impossibly long, perfectly straight just line. And that inside of it, it was always storming. Like here at the top, uh, you would just see storm clouds billowing up and out and around. And so that area would be very Seattle-ish in my mind of like it's gray and it's misting and spitting at you all the time. It is never not rainy. And uh, you could go into that trench and everything in there would be living with a massive amount of electricity. These creatures have adapted to magical storm forces. Uh, and that led to the idea of like, okay, but if people live there, why? Is there a resource? Is the, otherwise, no one would want to live there. So to justify people living in a place that storms all the time, I decided, well, this electrical current would develop a, a crystal, a rock, that could be harvested and used for magic. Uh, and you know, one thing leads to another, and I suddenly have a massive trench going through a whole side of a continent that, uh... Yeah, going through the side of a continent that is basically a, uh, a giant electrical field, and that there are, uh, electrical airships that only work close enough to that, uh, that trench to catch on that electrical current, but they don't need like a uh, they don't need like a zeppelin bag. The airships of the Apenya here, the ones that are there, they are basically zeppelins. Uh, but the ones of this human nation and the nations around it are basically just steel skiffs with a little bit of this stone in it that just catch the electrical current really strongly. And I uh, really liked that idea. Now that my players are done with this campaign, and they're uh, looking to do the next one, I'm, uh, we've decided to do a time skip. And the big thing that happened is that they uh, brought the gods back, and so now I have to consider a really interesting, like, I don't know, uh, convergence of things. Imagine, if you will, that worshipping a specific god could literally generate material, like a valuable material. Imagine if you uh, went to Catholic Mass and you literally, like, grew gold in the tin. Uh, would more people convert to that religion, do you think? Makes me wonder if, in this world I've made, if people would uh, worship Thoron only because... Uh, yeah, it does sound scary, actually. Uh, I'm imagining people worshipping Thoron in this way of... Uh, like, so that they can generate a bunch of this crystal and make their own flying vehicles that could fly around town. That seems so hollow to me for, like, religion, this, like, big, important cultural thing. Uh, but I really like that setup of, like, hey, how does it affect it? How do people deal with that? I don't know. Although, Lynx, I'm not sure if you meant that sounds scary, the people worshipping stuff for materials, or it sounds scary, the trench that I described. I'm really not exactly sure how much delay there is on this chat. Oh yeah, a religion conversion? I mean, an individual can go where they please. It would be more people gathering in one place to worship a god would then generate the material at that chapel. And I think, I mean, classic D&D, &D, yeah, yeah. And I think classic D&D &D to me has always felt like 
like post-Rome Europe if Rome never became Catholic? Like if they still had pantheons. Oh yeah, the economy is going to be weird about this, for sure. But yeah, I, I feel like Classic D&D is basically a bunch of pantheons uh, exist and people can worship more than one god. So it's not like, nope, only Thora. That's it. Uh, I'm sure people worship many uh, gods at a time. I feel like there's no such thing as... Uh, uh, what's the word for only worshiping one deity? I was going to say monogamy, but that's not right. Uh, monotheism. That's the word. Monotheism. I feel like that probably doesn't exist that much in D&D, especially because, like, gods actually exist and have power. Like, yeah, I've made a world where it physically makes materials with value, but honestly, classic D&D, you can go worship and get god lasers. Like, that also has value. I feel like there's got to be a weird relationship between power and religion in any world where the gods literally reach out and give people the ability to smite their foes directly. I mean, heck, I wouldn't be surprised if some sociopath in a D&D world goes and freaking worships whatever storm god or god of war just so that they can literally shoot lightning bolts or fireballs out of their hands, you know? But maybe I have a pessimistic view on people and religion in general. Not to poo-poo on anyone's religion in particular. I think individuals get a lot out of religion. I just think once you get enough people in a group for anything, you're going to get some assholes and, like, it, it bugs me sometimes. Uh, how religion is used by people to justify really shitty things. Yeah, so... One of the setups for this, and we'll see, it's probably still going to be the same thing, is that there is a godly element a material, much like the like Thoron crystal, the storm crystals, for uh, basically every damage type, as I think I always set it out, and then uh, one or two extras besides. There are all these gods that have done things. And I also set it up that there was a uh, god and demon, basically something that was generally good versus something that was generally evil, although I don't really like the alignment chart that much, but for metaphysical beings like a deity, I'm fine with I think it works really well. Alright. I'm getting to the point where I'm just going to make more work for myself and why do I do this? Uh, but, yeah, so there's definitely also a material for uh, poison and necrotic, and I think for piercing I made a crystal of order. Uh, it was always perfectly symmetrical. Stuff like that. And, uh, I believe the setup I made for my campaign for this was something, something, uh, a wizard brought back a bunch of the necrotic element when they really shouldn't have. It's definitely a necrotic element from an, the demon side of that element. Uh, and it does make me wonder if that's the same setup I should use for the game that's happening in, you know, four days. Mm -hmm. We shall see. I really wanted to wait till my players got back to me with, uh, what they were doing character-wise. But maybe I should just, uh, bite the bullet here and
think we make a, a sandbar out here too. This is a weird island. Why not? hear uh, Link's advice to me earlier today of like, don't burn yourself out, it doesn't have to be that complicated. But I must, I must make it complicated. I have to fight that urge, but... Mm, one more ship. We're doing one more ship, and then I'm gonna call it good on this sketch. Now we can see the part where I start coloring. Ublissa. I hope I pronounced that right, because I know you showed up a few times. How's it going? Uh, I just also know I haven't actually heard anyone pronounce it. Oh, hey, Lucian. Okay. That's right. I think I did know that. I just forgot. Chillin'? Yeah. Chillin'. All right. Now, let's see if I do this. Okay, that's a little hard to see. That's fine. So what we're going to do is... I'm just gonna bring the opacity down on this. Um, whoop, well, apparently it happens all at once and not bits at a time. Yeah, let's put it at 50. That works better. Alright. Can I raise my chair up? Ooh, yes, I can. Uh -huh. Guys, I'm uh, real particular about the angle of my chair when I'm typing. But, I will sacrifice that to get a better drawing angle here. Huh. Okay. Alright. You know what we're gonna do? You know what we're gonna do? I'm going to rest my hands for a second. Just a second. And instead of going to the, we'll be right back. Go to the talking screen so you can see Cat. Hey, Cat. We'll see if he stays in the room. But I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put my headphones down for a second and leave the room real quick and get myself some water. Mm. Yeah, that's what I do. See you guys in a second. Guys? See you guys, cat. Cat, cat, cat. Don't know if you guys could even hear him meow when he did. Ah, oh, you also get to see my dorky art glove. Otherwise, the screen detects the backside of my hand because I didn't go to no fancy art school that taught me how to not do that. Yep, and cat is gone now. That's sad. Eh, he's probably just going to check out what's happening downstairs. But it's fine. He's a very finicky little boy. He is quite skittish, and if the doorbell rings, he will run away. He'll run away 
all the way underneath the bed and he will not come out because he's afraid of people in every way. It does look like a backwards billiard glove, I think you're right. Uh, I actually took a billiards class in college just for funsies, I need to do an extra credit. And it was kind of fun being much, much better at a, uh, at a sport isn't the right word, but like a contest than my uh, father was. Because, you know, I was 18 and I wasn't better than him at anything he wanted to do at the time. Uh, I mean, I was better at some things, like I guess fencing and math, but he wasn't about to do that. And they're dorky, they're fencing and math. Billiards was cool. He even used to be able to do cool jump shot bullshit, like you bounce it over another ball. It was fun. Alrighty. Now. Now, what we're gonna do... I'm gonna find the right color for this, but... Hmm. We need to find something that looks like sand. I think it's close. Because the best way to do this, chat, is start with the lowest layer of thing. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, jump shots are pretty fun. Uh, uh, but yeah, put a little English on it. Just give it a little spin. If you can get the cue ball to do a nice little turn, I agree. I agree, Lucian. That's always very good. I think my favorite thing to do is when you have to like get a shot on the wrong side so you can't lean over instead you put the pool cue behind your back and you kind of lean back it just feels really cool even if it's just the dumbest little thing all right let's yeah I think that's mm, a little lighter I mean, there's some places I've been to where the sand is just, like, blindingly white, but we're not gonna do that. This is gonna... This is gonna feel... It's gonna feel warm, I think. I think it'll contrast nicely. Also, what we're gonna do is use a brush tool instead. Now, this is a thing that I'm not great at, is selecting the right tool. I think the one I'm using now, though... Is one of the Kyle's ones. Uh, I don't know. I really love this channel, Drawfee. Uh, they're a bunch of actual professional ass artists that are real good uh, at their job. Uh, and when they recommend, oh, this brush feels really cool and loose and sketchy, I'm like, ah, I gotta get me some of that. Alright, uh, also, we're just gonna. We're gonna bump the pixel count up on this quite a bit. Let's get to 50. No, way more than that. Can I watch it get bigger over here? Hmm. 100 pixels is maybe closer. And the goal is going to be, chat, that I'm going to not necessarily stay completely in these lines, but kinda. Kinda in those lines. And I picked a lighter brown so that I can do the outline here, and then I can also add some grass in later and then make the roads basically a uh, darker brown, like a richer, wetter earth. And then the sides of the cliffs will be gray, the top of the buildings. I'm thinking red tile. I don't know why, but this reminds me of uh, Southern California a little bit, this island. Uh, I don't know. I associate that with red tile. Alright, what we also need to do, before I forget, because I just said I forget this a lot, is make a new layer and call this... What do you want to call this? I'm going to call this island. And let's just make some other new layers here. I know some artists that just have no named layers, and so they have like layers 1 through 27. They just kind of have to guess what it is, and uh, I don't play like that. Can't do that. Nope, not happen. So let's say uh, buildings. I 
if I can spell it right. Mm -hmm. You get to see my horde spelling in real time. And then... Let's rename background. Is it going to let me rename? Yeah, this is going to be... Oh, shit. Probably misspelled, but that's fine. We may make a layer on top of Ocean for little details like sea foam or what have you, but for now, I'm not playing with none of that. Let's see, I'm gonna... Yeah, I'm gonna make this just a tad bigger, just to save time. Alright, chat. So, this is the part where I wear out the undo button. Real hard, because that wasn't exactly what I wanted. So I'm using a sketchier brush for several reasons. One of which is I'm not that exact or good. I really am not. Let's zoom in some. So making it look kind of impressionistic and artsy like this means any flaws I can blame on style. That's a big brain move right there. The artist equivalent of a gamer move, that's what that is. Alright. We're just kind of filling a little more of this, not much though, because I think the town is probably good on ground cover grass type stuff. Well, then I think about it, I'm not sure. I mean, most of the islands I have visited have a lot of grass, but I don't know that they naturally do. Is that a thing that normally semi-tropical islands have? This is uh, pretty close to the equator, so it'll be hot as hell. As it is, I'm thinking these parts up against the cliffs are actually going to be that darker, uh, darker brown for the roads that I mentioned before. Another reason I like this brush is it's smaller if you do it, press it lightly. So like, I can get some real fine detail in there if I need to. Not that I'm good enough to really do it on purpose the way I want, but... Righty. that I'm not great at, that I really should get better at, is uh, being okay with moving my canvas around on the screen. Because, like, it's not like canvas cops. You don't have to paint it like it's one big piece of paper. It's fine. Adjusting the canvas so that you have the best uh, drawing angle isn't a sin. But it still feels weird to me, just a thing I forget to do. Because I'm used to notebooks and pencils, and I really ought to get better at this so that I can be better as an artist as a whole. Because uh, physical paints are expensive, and I don't know, this just seems significantly more accessible to me. Alright. 
Alright, now... That's what I want to do. Let's get a nice deep green. Let's get a nice... Grassy green. I'm going to say this. This green. Well, good luck on your test then, Lucian. Like, really, uh, oof, I remember college classes with dread, uh, especially take-home tests. I, I like some of the projects I had, but yeah, good luck on uh, any of those tests. Those are, uh, oof. Oof. Maybe me coming up with details out of my own brain, but uh, it feels like to me that grass grows fairly well next to cliffs and just not so much next to the beach. I'm not going to be remotely close enough in this to uh, talk about it, but or not remotely close enough in this map to. Uh, see it, but definitely in other maps I've painted this way for my home game, I've uh, been a dumb and added actual like little blades of grass every once in a while to be like, hey look, grass, that's a thing, right? It was uh, ill-advised is what I would say. Hmm. What I'm gonna do actually, let's find the brown for the road. Let's find that dirt color I want. Yeah, now on uh, one of these color pickers, it turns out that uh, all the sand and wood and browns are all in this little orange area. And I don't know. I don't think I expected that to be there. Right. Let's see what this... Specifically, so I can then go back with the green and touch up, touch up those bits. Also, what I'm gonna have to do is find a good way to blend these two colors, and that's just not something I'm super familiar with.
Coloring this this way does feel a little bit like the artist equivalent of procrastinating. Because as I layer these colors, I'm basically saying, oh, future me will deal with the fiddly details. You know, that's fine. Let's move up here. Although I've just realized that I did all these roads and I'm about to do all over them with green. Oh well. That was... Maybe not the smartest. Oh well, oh well, oh well. That's fine. Green, and like I just said, whoopsie frickin' doodle, but maybe, I don't know, well hold on, maybe we'll just, uh, eh? now I'm gonna do all of them with green. Yep, chat, I wasted a whole bunch of time doing it this way, but that's... fine. Didn't heed my own advice of... layers. some of these in. Tell you what, Chad, I'm getting a new appreciation for Bob Ross's, Ross's show. He's very good at keeping up conversation while he's doing this sort of thing. Alright, we're just gonna... Okay. Now, funny enough, I don't really have strong feelings about having a straight cutoff between grass and sand. That makes sense to me. It's the round dirt becomes sandy beach that I'm like, oh, there should probably be some gradient to that. Maybe that's just me being nitpicky. Maybe I can just leave it as is, those little spots. You might have to tell me, chat. then. Hmm. I don't know. I'm starting to run out of uh, topics to talk about specifically. I could keep going on about my setting, but I don't know that that's the thing y'all want. Especially because I don't know. We could maybe do a campaign in this. I think I'd like to stick to doing 
just the running just the cyberpunk game on stream, but I don't know. We could. Uh, I think Foxy and I have mentioned we should eventually, when these campaigns that we're running are run their course, or swap systems or try new ones. I'm really excited to just try out a bunch of different role-playing stuff on this channel, honestly. I'm always feeling like I don't try out other game systems enough, and running Cyberpunk Red has been a delight. Learning more systems and such, and you know, I think it improves uh, all of your tabletop that you run when you learn new systems. In my uh, home game, that's like the time forwarded, like the time jump version of this setting, uh, I'm gonna steal some of those uh, gun mechanics that Cyberpunk does. The uh, use multiple shots out of a gun for auto fire, and then it's like a avoid it, save as opposed to an attack. I think that's a pretty fun idea for any kind of, I guess, gun thing. What's really gonna have to balance out is action economy. In Cyberpunk you get an attack or an item to use, you don't get both, and most attacks you only get one of. It's actually rarer to get two attacks. So if we translate that over to D&D, either the fighter is gonna get two to four like area of effect cone things which could be way overpowering if you throw enough saves at something at D&D it will fail eventually uh, or or the fighter has to give up four freaking attacks for a single shotgun blast or a single uh, auto fire thing and that's eh, that, that feels a little unfair to the fighter honestly like I don't know why would the fighter give up all of that? Why would the fighter give up all of that for one save, especially if it's not all that strong? Maybe I should make it stronger. Yeah, it's a balancing game. It's a balancing game. If you guys have never had to run a game, I'm telling you, I sleep way less on days that I run games because I'm the day after because my brain is just full of all the little calculations and judgments and things I do. Alright. Alright, now... Now let's redo these roads because I made boo-boos. This bit, this song. There's something about nature sounds. Hmm. Chad, I have spotted a flaw. You can catch it, there's a hole right there. Just a big old one right in the middle. This is getting closer to what I want. Let's just... And I think I see a little speck of something over there. Alright. Alright, alright, alright. Alright, alright, alright. Let's bring that sketch layer back. I gotta say, I didn't. I don't have a lot of experience doing any of this in a real, uh, what's the word, like a professional level context. But it's been quite fun for me, as I, as you know, all the D and D games had to move uh, online, like my home game did for a long while. Uh, it's been fun for me to sort of learn and relearn painting in such a very basic very basic way of simple maps. Like I would hesitate to ever say, oh yeah, I'm good at this. A lot of the maps we use are from uh, various Patreon places. But, but it is nice to do, and for a one-shot I'm willing to just throw it out there. Yeah, let's make this a field. Yeah, let's make this a little farm. 
But imagine an island like this really mostly subsides on, like, fish and other things they can get from the ocean. But that's real life. When you have literally druids that can bless the ground to produce way more crops than they should, I feel like you might be able to get a little something-something out of an ocean garden, right? You have the cleric come by every day and just create water. The thing I think that a lot of D&D &D world building, or just fantasy world building in general, doesn't consider how common are some of these magic spells and how... Why would people use them just for combat? It feels like there should be way more spells for gardening. Where's the... Oh, come on. Where's the banish, banish aphids spell for the little old lady Janice down the street? That's what I want to know. Because, uh, yeah, that's a spell that would get used a bunch. But every spell is like a killing spell, and I don't know, not to be too judgmental, but I'm gonna be. Why? Why do, why do I have to kill literally everything? That seems weird to me. Let's just add a little bit more road here. Uh, just like a little bit there. Just trying to think of the practical parts of people getting uh, their stuff from the dock to the rest of the town. I imagine these uh, two buildings. Uh, imagine the. Oh, nope, go away. Imagine the two buildings here and here are. I don't know, like, uh, oh, what's the word? They're just like storehouses, or they're a place where someone buys and sells for the whole town. Uh, depots, I guess, supply depots. Eh. And, you know, so I'll have to build the dock up to those, however I'm going to do wood. I'll figure that out in a second. Uh, that'll be part of the buildings, but however I end up doing, the dock has got to be all the way up to there, and then, you know, stuff has to pass behind it and through it. And eventually make it to. Eventually make it to the rest of the town. Oop, was on the wrong layer. That happens. Alright, now. Now let's get us a gray. Chad, this is the thing about drawing that I'm not great at is color theory. But it's my understanding that if we want this to blend well, what we should do is pick a gray, because you can pick a gray from any color, but pick one from maybe the blue of the background. So let's... Yeah, okay, stop it. Let's bring that ocean... No, let's bring the white out. Let's vanish the white out a bit. Let's pick island. Actually, so that's the blue we're at. So maybe we pick a gray. And I gotta remember to pick a lighter gray so I have a darker gray on the other side so I can imply, I guess, uh, some directional sunlight to the side of this. But yeah, let's let's pick. This is going to be a lot of this. Let's see how I feel about the color real quick. So more about this setting, because it's relevant to talking about color. Uh, 
my players were level 19-ish. Uh, actually, I think they had just gotten to level 20, or they were about there. Unsure. Anyways, they were extremely high level, and uh, they uh, wanted to have like a great big difficult adventure. And there is a continent on the other side of the world that I uh, haven't drawn for you, and uh, it's not really important as to the shape or location. And I decided the whole thing had illithids. I think illithids, mind play flayers, I think they're cool as hell. Uh, and so I decided, you know, what we're going to do is that it's a continent full of mind flayers that got onto the plane before, or uh, the world of the plane, planar thing, uh, before it got separated out. And in fact, there is a god of psychic damage, or there was, and that they beat him and ate him. Or them, I should say, because I don't know that I ever picked an actual gender for that god. But yeah, they uh, killed the god of mind and ate it. And uh, so I'm like, yeah, that'll be a pretty big epic enemy. But I ended up having to draw just a bunch of maps for it. Like, way more than I really thought I was going to, as I drew just a bunch of illithid facilities. Just a whole metric ton of them. And uh, one of the interesting things I found is I could make them all look more uniform, I guess, if I... Basically, every color I picked, if I made it a little purple. I think what I ended up doing was drawing it just in grays, because it's, you know, a metal facility. Uh, and then just adding a, a light, light layer of purple. Just really transparent layer of purple over the top of it. Uh, that's the shape I want. All right. Eh. Sorry, guys. My pen is misbehaving. All right. I'm not going to do all of these, but I do want to put... Oh, boo. I did more than I thought I would. Chill uh, playlist. I keep on hearing songs I recognize, and then I stop and I'm like, "Where's this from?" I have this uh, book in my library that if the camera's on. You'd see behind me uh, a book on animation. It's called the Animations uh, Animator Survival Handbook, I believe, uh, or the Animator Survival Kit. It's uh, written by the guys that did. Or it's written by one of the guys that did, like, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? And uh, was, like, involved with a lot of Disney animation early on. Whose name escapes me? Let me actually go find it. Yeah, Richard Williams. Uh, I'm not familiar with a lot of animation names, but I really loved a lot of the anecdotes. And one was talking to uh, a very famous animator at the time, I believe Milt. And he drew a little comic about it, where he goes up to this guy and he's like... Oh, uh, hey, hey, Milt, uh, do you ever listen to classic music while you, uh, classical music while you animate? And then, uh, he draws Milt as just this dude who jumps out of his chair and is huge and stretched out, and he's like, Are you crazy? I'm not smart enough to think of two different things at once! So I wonder, now I wonder, maybe this playlist is distracting. The difference is, is, uh, I'm not smart enough to do one thing at once, so it's not really that important that I'm not maybe fully concentrating on this. It's in fact totally fine if I'm not. It would be great if the pen didn't go all spazzy on me sometimes. I think I have a topic I can talk on for a minute. It's not necessarily what I'm drawing right now. So, one of the things I'm interested about when it comes to making your own world in D&D, or even just interpreting the one they have, and I feel like a lot of people don't think about this, but I feel like you almost need to consider the metaphysics 
of like the magic in your world. Like, yeah, you have the mechanics. It's Vancian. That's the term for it, where you have a list of spells that already exist and they're not really very mutable. And then you just have, you know, slots. It's not even mana. It's you can do a certain number of those spells a day dictated by a thing. And that's nothing wrong with that, per se. But that doesn't really describe how magic works. You know, are you... If you're casting a fireball, say, are you asking the nature of fire politely to come out and do fire? Are you asking... Are you telling it? Have you captured fire in a bottle somewhere in your wizard's tower? And you're like, no, you will obey me. Do you know fire's true name? Those all feel... Why did I do that? Now, those all feel very different to me in a way that I think describing that for your own setting will kind of help you decide on, like, really specific, uh, like, rules contradictions, I guess. You know, players are going to ask to do weird stuff with the magic, and there's no reason not to let them. The only reason would be you're not sure how to adjudicate it. And I'm trying to think of examples, but while I do that, it's difficult to draw at the same time. Uh, but like, uh, da, da, da. why is it doing that? Sorry, the pen is going all spazzy on me. It's breaking my concentration. So like, uh, one of my players is playing uh, Barbarian. Basically. It was really a custom class, and I kind of was like, nah, maybe we shouldn't have done that, but it doesn't matter. So, cause it was a, basically a barbarian for the purposes of the story, because they had a rage where they would gain resistance to bludgeoning and such. And had a very, very high athletic score. Like, kind of crazy high. Uh, and what they had was a shield uh, that, when they said the word, it went from being, you know, five pounds to two tons. Uh, the two-ton shield. If anyone knows where I stole that idea from, uh, we had a very similar childhood, I guess. I don't know how to say after that. Anyways, so their plan normally with this shield, what I thought they were going to use with it, is to pin something down. At best, maybe drop things off a ledge onto an enemy. What they ended up doing was getting an airship to fly them extremely high over a battlefield and then dropping themselves on top of a flying fortress while they were two tons. Uh, and themselves, specifically. Like, they went down with it because, uh, I don't know, reasons? They didn't trust just the aim? They wanted to pick it up afterwards? Unclear. But what they did, though, was they had an item that cast Featherfall on them. So I had to adjudicate, should that work? And, like... I had no real fucking idea, because we just kind of logic out, this is how magic works, this is what it does, we decided, oh no, this uh, doesn't stop, this kind of stops you from falling, technically, but it doesn't, like, stop all your weight from falling, it stops you from falling, to a small extent, and uh, yeah, I let them do it. They took much less damage. It helped me decide how much damage they were going to take. But it was, uh, I don't know. It was only because I thought, all right, this is how magic works in this world, in this setting. It's not just you defy physics, it's you affect physics in specific ways based on what you ask. I don't know. Maybe that was a long rant that really didn't mean anything. Hopefully, you guys are still okay with me, and I'm not boring everyone to tears. Alright, come on, little. Oh, it was cool, good stuff. Okay, good. Eh. I'm telling you, Photoshop is killing me right now, guys, with its janky pen stuff going on. I'm seriously considering sometimes to just dump Photoshop. I've used GIMP before, but it just doesn't have a lot of features. I hear there's other programs you could use that work better. I don't know. Alright, let's... Uh, 
let's move the sketch layer. How do I feel? How do I feel? Well, first, let's just cover up a bit of these gaps. Yeah, I think I like that color. I think I like that color a lot. thing again where I forget to move the canvas, which I remind everyone I am allowed to do. I'm just dumb and don't do it. There's no law that says I cannot. No canvas police that will come and get me. Uh, because I have a hard time having Streamlabs open at the same time as uh, this. I'm curious as to if you guys see a lot of the zooming or if it is capturing the whole thing separately. Hmm. Oh, right, I also gotta... No. Any other gaps down here? Anyways, with uh, links telling me it is good, I will continue on this topic. Uh, I think there's a few canon explanations for what magic is, depending on the D&D setting. I know some of them have something like the weave, where magic is just an inherent force of nature that's in everything, and the idea of the weave is you're actually just sort of plucking at the strings of reality, and I love the flavor of that. I think it's very, very good. Uh, it really gives a good flavor, I think, to something like, say, Dispel Magic. It's almost like you're just sticking your hand on a guitar neck. You're just... No sound. Uh, I think the other one is you are calling on planes of specific kinds of energies. And you're... Uh, you know, if you heal someone, you're calling on a plane of health. And that has a certain good flavor because then you're like, well, those are places I can go to, right? There's apparently an old manual, I think, for 3.5, but maybe it was older... Uh, where you could go to the plane of health, and the whole bit was you'd keep gaining HP the longer you were there. Uh, but if you actually gained like double the HP of what you normally have at max, uh, you would explode in a shower of like organs and blood because your body has generated too much flesh. It wasn't really the plane of health; it was the plane of blood and guts, and like that's really a weird decision. But I kind of dig it. I don't know. That was. It was definitely a thing they decided to do. Uh, but I can get behind that. I think that that kind of flavor is very fun. Uh, in my setting, what you were technically doing is that the world was made by sort of godly whim, and magic was different depending on which class was doing it. If it's a cleric, you're just acting enough like the god of the thing you're doing, that you basically trick the world into thinking you are that one. Uh, a wizard just understood the very base mechanics of it, and applying just the smallest amount of arcanic force could uh, basically do like a trick shot. Like to do a fireball, they didn't act like a god of fire, they didn't pray like one. What they did was shoot a little bit of energy at the right spot to excite a bunch of molecules into spark and fireball. Uh, I think the rangers and druids with this druidic magic, uh, basically, instead of acting like a god uh, of a similar element, they were just familiar enough with the natural world and how it was supposed to work that they could ask nicely. I think what I had bards do is I like the idea of like the strings, the vibrations, but for them it was it was pleasing the universe. So instead of asking politely, it was like sucking up to it. It's like, yeah, you know you want to give me a fireball. And the universe is like, yeah, you're right, I want to give you a fireball. Uh, but it had a lot to do with like specific vibrations of sound generally. Uh, just because I 
I know you can be a bard with anything, but I like the idea of sound creating magic. I don't know, it's the musician in me. I did, you know, piano for so long in my life, and then band for so long, and both of my sisters are very good singers. I just feel like music should have power in some way. Uh, and Paladins was just through sheer force of will. It's just, I believe so strongly in the thing I am doing. It will happen. And you do it so strongly, the universe is like, well, shit, yeah, okay. You're doing that. Music is its own magic. Yeah, see? Lynx gets it. There's a book series. Uh, uh, something of Foo? The Foo book series? I don't remember what it's called. It's kind of like a kid fantasy book. Uh, but it had some really fun, interesting ideas of, like, a world of dreams where you can't die. Or, actually, you can't die, you just can't kill anyone on purpose. And the assassins in this world are people who are very good at accidentally killing someone. Uh, but the whole idea is that there's the real world, and there's this dream world, and the way you get into the real from the real world to the dream world is you have to be standing at a corner of an intersection where the roads don't quite meet up. Not two different roads, like uh, one like 100 north and 150 north, but the same road, it's labeled the same and slightly off. If you're standing at the corner of that, and the temperature is divisible by seven, and then, uh, quote, a shooting star passes by, unquote, uh, then you get teleported into this dreamland. And then one guy figured out how to make a permanent portal, because it's not just a shooting star coming by, it's something that pleases the universe. This is my favorite little detail of the world, because the guy who makes the portal, he puts it at the bottom of a lake where the temperature is very consistent up in the mountain, so it's very cold. And then, yeah, he just takes out a section of a road that doesn't match up, places it at the bottom of this lake, and this lake has a resort, and this resort has, like, every other hour, this boat tour, uh, where a boat goes out in the water with a bunch of tourists, and another boat is next to it, and a guy with a trumpet plays just a beautiful beautiful solo and that pleases the universe the idea of music pleasing the universe is such a fun idea to me and that causing magic is very very good yeah links i it's like the guardians of foo i think is one of them or something like that or maybe that's the name of the series it was wild and weird uh i think there's a lot to be said about its magic system effectively uh there's a uh, fiction writer that is extremely famous and popular in Utah, and I think still pretty popular other places, called Brandon Sanderson, and he had... Oh yeah, the main character had funky hair, thanks, for sure. But no, Brandon Sanderson uh, does a lot of teaching on writing fiction, and is very, very good, and he has a whole series on how to make magic systems. I think he'd have something to say about how uh, wiggly and soft the magic system in the Foo books is. <laughs> uh, according to him, because I love this topic, and can talk about it for hours. Uh, according to him, a magic system can be hard, meaning it has a lot of strict rules and costs, and the limits of the magic system are extremely well defined. Uh, I'm trying to think of a really good example. Uh, the Alchemy in Full Metal Alchemist is a great example. You have to know exact mathematical chemis uh, chemical formulas. You have to know everything that's going into it. You have to idealize how the chemistry works in your mind and then draw a great big circle. Or if you're the main character, just clap your hands. I know there's another reason, but that's how we're going to say it. Uh, it's a very hard magic system. Uh, extremely hard magic system. Whereas, say, Gandalf's magic in Lord of the Rings is extremely soft. It has basically no rules and uh, there doesn't really define what the cost is or what he can even do with it. But that doesn't mean it's bad. Uh, Sanderson's theory would be that your ability or your ability to solve problems in a story and not piss off your audience is directly proportional to how hard or soft the magic system is. A hard magic system, you can you have your main character solve all sorts of problems with that magic system because it feels clever when he pulls it off. When the main character uses the rules of magic and finds some cool new loophole or thing, it feels cool. You know, when Edward Elric frickin' uh, makes a whole cannon into a speaker to beat the one priest guy in the early episodes. That's why I can say it, because it's not a spoiler. Uh, that feels great. It's like, yeah, we know he could do that, and he did it. And it's uh, super cool and inventive. Oh, wow. You know, hold on. Sorry, guys, it made a weird splotch, but... Whoop. 
Actually... I'm actually perfectly fine with that splotch. We're gonna keep that splotch, because that splotch already looks like a rock. For these floaty rocks, I'm down with splotches. Although I still wish... Is it pe picking up my hand? I have the glove on. What the hell? Huh. Yeah, I don't know if uh, Lan is in here. I think he is, I don't know if he's listening, but... Uh, why is Nightbot sending, like, three, two to three messages at a time? It doesn't seem to really, really spread out very well. I mean, I'm not exceptionally good at Twitch, but that seems like a thing we don't want it to do, right? I don't know. Maybe if people were just chatting more, they wouldn't be, uh... They wouldn't be right next to each other. Maybe I should blame chat? Yeah. <laughs> Heck if I know, says Lynx. Links gets two words in, and then the third one happens. Yeah, it, it is spaced out some. This is just a chill stream. People just listening. I'm down with that. I'm fine with that. We don't have to have a whole uproarous thing. I am just kind of making maps. You know, I find this kind of thing pretty enjoyable alone, but this is definitely a fun and new experience with people watching. Generally, if I'm at home, and like, my husband, or my roommate, or someone is watching over my shoulder, that's fine too, just, generally people aren't interested in watching the same way, you know? And honestly, if they're right over my shoulder, sometimes people try to give advice, and it's not that I'm against advice in general, I just don't really want advice while I'm doing the thing. I would rather wait until I am done and someone looks at a final product. Ah, uh, Lynx is gone. Alright, see ya! Yeah, you definitely gotta sleep if you gotta get up early. What's it, 10 o'clock over there? Y'all, I'm in Utah and it's only uh, 8, which is great for me. Although I haven't had dinner yet. I'm starting to get kind of hungry. It doesn't matter. But yeah, uh, Lynx has got to get to sleep so that she can be ready for our game tomorrow. We're doing, uh, you know, we missed Seven Sons. You know, part of it was my fault. I was uh, off camping. I was off camping, so I wasn't around. It was uh, kind of a thing we've been planning for a while. But uh, yeah, because it ended up not happening, uh, we're just gonna we're just gonna Seven Sons it up tomorrow. I gotta say, y'all, I'm, I'm I'm quite liking my character for Seven Sons. I don't know, I really enjoy a character that, uh, how do I say, that uh, is an unconventional fighter. I find them very fun. Uh, I end up putting a lot of Monk into uh, fun classes just because I do like me a punchy boy. Uh, I also put a lot of Ranger just because something about Rangers, man, I don't know. But anyways, uh, it was very fun to me to find this Barbarian subclass that is official material where you just get, like, werewolf bits. It's very good. Especially because then it's like, ah, I don't need no axe. I've also built him with a few feats and stuff, so he even especially doesn't need an axe. Uh, one of the feats, Tavern Brawler, if you're familiar enough with D&D to know it, is, I think, one of the funniest and my favorite. It's not even really optimal for most builds. Uh, I think there's a fist fighter uh, setup I've done once, or I've planned out once that really benefits from that really benefits from a uh, tavern brawler but eh it's not necessarily optimal but it's fun as shit because you get to just pick up anything and use it as a weapon and nothing is more satisfying than just picking up a chair and killing someone with it it's very good uh in D D. hey in D. &D. <laughs> anyways yeah, you know, it's very fun to do that, and uh, just being able to punch stuff, and it uh, gives you an extra little, like, grapple bonus. Uh, but since you can use anything as a weapon, I'm convinced that the coolest and most interesting paladin one could make would be a, a paladin that has tavern brawler as a feat, because then you can hit people with your shield, and uh, now you're kind of Captain America. You can't really throw it effectively, but eh, you still 
smack people with a shield and do a bunch of damage. And as a paladin, then you can smite them. Paladin smites are very funny to me. Especially in the context of my own setting, where I believe very strongly that this that this enemy should be dead. This cultist right here, I really believe he should be explodified like so much, I am convinced. And then it happens. up this little bit here. Mm -hmm. nah. Alright, we're gonna remove the sketch layer. to plan stuff out with a sketch layer and when I'm filling in a sketch layer I try and fill it in somewhat strictly uh, but with this lineless art style I'm perfectly fine after the fact of just kind of just kind of futzing with it just saying hey what can we what can we change here Just a little detail to this guy here. So we take that same brown and uh, let's see if I just make it a little bluer, maybe a little blacker, just a little, a little darker, and then uh, let's. Make this brush much smaller. Say 40. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 40. I think that'll work. And then we just, uh, whoop. 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 No, let's. these a little more whoa, whoa. a little more equidistant All right, it's a small farm it's a very small farm but you know that's fine something doesn't have to be big to be worthwhile sometimes it's fine it's simple and small. I've got to tell myself that sometimes, because otherwise I kind of forget. But it's okay to enjoy something just because you enjoy it. It's okay to do something because it has value to you. It's been uh, having a lot of fun learning more about streaming and doing this and playing tabletop games with my friends. My new friends here. Honestly, a lot of y'all are pretty new friends for me and I'm enjoying meeting y'all. I think maybe that's worth it. Maybe it doesn't matter if, you know, I never get rich and famous doing this. I mean, that's the dream. That's what I would love to do, is make some money. But I don't have to don't have to, and that's fine. Right, let's... Oh yeah, I missed a stone right here. Then yeah, let's just, just add a few more. What do we got? 
Funny chat. My uh, sibling ended up telling my dad that I was doing this, and I love my dad, but he's definitely a very traditional, strict business type person. So I definitely framed it as a, you know, I lend my money doing this. It'll be good. You know, I could make a career out of this. Which he got more interested in, and then uh, asked to follow me on here. He may have may not have made an account for him and for uh, my stepmom, and that's very funny to me because they are not uh, internet people. They're not like not tech savvy. They actually do very 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 well with technology compared to a lot of like my uh, in-laws or just uh, other people's parents that I am uh, that are my peers. But they're not internet people. You feel like they know how the technology works, but they don't spend their time on the internet. And you know, they're not gonna judge me for swearing a bunch of fuck, but they're definitely gonna. It's definitely gonna be weird. It's definitely gonna be weird for them to be like, yeah, so uh, I saw that your uh, werewolf boyfriend guy uh, nearly died, or you're doing a weird romance thing in here. Is your husband gonna be okay with that? You know, those are gonna be some odd questions. They're definitely not the kind of people who have played tabletop much before and know how any of that is supposed to work. Man, Lan just picked a go. Lan just picked a real good playlist. I'm, I'm, I'm digging this. Alright, I need to not be so uh, enamored with this. Let's uh, yeah, maybe this is good for this step, I think. I think if I zoom out, that is not a bad island scape. I think I'm going to not do the uh, the dirt blending. Sorry, chat, but I'm just like, ugh, how am I even doing that? I don't know. Uh, well, maybe I could just use a smudge tool or a sponge tool. No, that's color saturation. Blur. All right, let's let's give this a little bit of a try. Although we gotta make that way less big. Let's... All right, let's let's see if we can't. Hmm, it's a bit. Not that light and stuff. Let's... Oh, no, I like that. Let's... Okay, okay. Alright, yeah, yeah, that works. Alright, then let's... Let's make this much, much smaller. Much, much, much smaller. Zoom in a little. Let's see if we can do some similar work with. Okay. 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 See, learn new things every day. Also learned that I got some touch-ups to do with the colors here, but that's that's fine. That's just fine. This really is the kind of art project where. I can put a bunch of extra, a bunch of extra time and effort into it if I really, really want to. And I like to do that sort of thing. It's satisfying for me, but it is also, I don't know, it's maybe a bit much. It's maybe a bit much to spend all my time doing this when it's for a one shot. I can keep the map though. I can use it later. Alright, let's, let's 
let's find that smudge tool again. I was digging that. Ooh. Yeah, that's that's the effect I was looking for. Of just it ends up feeling when people have tracked some of this wetter earth into the sand. playlist but I keep on hearing stuff and being like what's that? I swear I know what that is. Let's just clean that edge up a little. up with gray actually. And I do need to Alright, now let's maybe blur this just a bit. To me, a lot of this kind of digital art, a lot of it is what, how much patience do you have for all these extra little details? So you have a lot of patience and you're good at it, you, it, it does make your art look better. You do more, you add more, maybe not necessarily details as in like a bunch of extra little lines, but little details in where the color lies or taking care to be pick exactly the right colors extra little filters things like that it seems like there's the big difference between me and amateur and like guys on draw fee on youtube they're you know significantly better all right let's zoom out here so i need to pick two colors here i'm going to start with this brown just to make sure i don't hit the right the same one Kind of. Oh, all right, that's not what I want to do. Maybe make it a little redder. What do you guys think? And that way, the town has a certain red standing out against the blue. got a lot of uh, material from redwoods. Hmm. Okay, let's let's go with that. And I also need grouping, which is gonna be even more red. Like I said, I think I'm going to make this, I don't know, this uh, part of the setting that I've made. For some reason I associate islands with like red tile roofs. I grew up a lot in California and something about Southern California feels breezy and fresh and homey to me. Interesting song. Alrighty, so let's 
go up here, maybe zoom in a bit. So, imagining this being some sort of like administrative building. Oh, hat, not on a paintbrush. That is why it is not working. do roof tiles with this, so a lot of the square shapes. Uh, although I guess some of the round ones too, and it's only for down here. I think the Apeña one, because it is made by a different people, and from the town, and probably before the town was made, is going to have a different color to it. It also, made by a bee people, does have a sort of a hive shape, the uh, circular bit sort of right on top of here is actually like a big yellow honeycomb thing. And because they favor airships, I got a little a little uh, stick of a thing sticking out of that circle is uh, where airships would dock. Which uh, may be important later. Ooh. I don't know if any of my players for the one shot are here on stream. I don't think I would do this kind of stream for a cyberpunk map. But, it is fun to do for a one-shot map. Especially because, you know, it's a one-shot. Nobody... It's not a big deal if someone is a little metagamey, or... I would maybe try and avoid spoilering the players just for their enjoyment, but... Especially this map isn't a big deal. I don't know that I would be opposed to doing, uh, uh, what's the word, the uh, interior map of the Apeña facility, where much of the campaign is going to happen. Maybe doing that would ruin the fun for some of the players. But I don't know. I bet I could do the ground floor and it isn't a problem. In setting, the players probably have been in there before if they cared to. I mean, it's not, it's kind of a fort, kind of a research facility, but locals can tour it. So I don't see why the players wouldn't perhaps uh, have just looked at it, checked it out, see what all the fuss is. But maybe not. You know a guy who lives in California, or sorry, lives in New York, and has never in his life been to the Empire State Building. And I'm like, but why have you not? It's right there, and it's, in my opinion, kind of cool. And they just said, I don't know. I can go anytime I want. Why in the world would I go now? Like, it's always there, and to him at least, it's kind of, eh, it's kind of just lame. It's always there. All right, let's give you a little more, a little more. Let's 
just make some small squares. How about it, chat? Just a few small squares. When it comes to this kind of one shot, I'm always questioning how much detail should I put in this town? Because I could just go on a rant. I think it's one of the few really useless but interesting gifts I have is I could just come up with a story for this and the people in this place right now and it would just be kind of fun to do and for me I don't know that anyone else would have a fun time with it but uh, maybe use a name generator because names for uh, various uh, fantasy races that are somewhat analogous to various other fantasy, real world or fantasy cultures are the kind of thing that I like can't come up with on the spot unless I'm extremely familiar with the phonetics, I guess. I gotta come up with an English sounding name pretty easy, just because that's the language I speak. But anything else I get a little like, I don't know. I think my standard like name holder, if no one hands me a name for a thing, is uh, like something McGee. Uh, or Mick something, just because I think it sounds funny. Sorry if that's how your name ends, but eh. it sounds so obviously like I'm reaching, and I think that's a pretty good joke for me. If you can't prevent yourself from being a little unprepared and goofy, you might as well lean into the aesthetic, right? I can already imagine that, like, uh, the four buildings on the corner here are all businesses that would cater to the sailors that come in. And, like I think I said already in this stream, the standard D&D, uh, the setting feels to me as if, like, after the collapse of Rome, but if... Catholicism never existed. And to that extent, there's always some universe things that are never said explicitly that I'm like, I'm putting this in because no one can stop me. Just you fucking try. Stuff like, I feel like people would be way less prudish. Like, look, the Romans and didn't even really have a strong sense of what adultery was. There's some hilarious stories I've heard historians and history majors tell about just how much Caesar slept with basically everyone who would let him, and it wasn't, like, considered that bad. Uh, it was definitely a power dynamic, which of course it was, it was the Romans. But you know, eh. You know, you learn more about, say, Vikings that were very much not Catholicized for a very long time. They were pretty chill about a lot of different gender and sex stuff. And like, I kind of want to put that in my D&D campaigns. The way this is relevant to this town is, I don't know, do you think that there's prostitution on this island? I don't see why not. You know, sex work is work, and uh, sailors are gonna get lonely out there when they come in. And then I get torn between, do I want this to feel like some small town that's just kind of out of the way trading post, or am I letting my, like, sort of Christian sensibilities to what constitutes a small, well-knit town get in the way when I hesitate to say, yep, this has brothel in it, it's fine. It's definitely an American Christian-raised thought, I guess. Of like, no, there can't be that there in this small town. Well, why not? I know this is canon, mind you. I'm just sort of rambling about world-building stuff. There's always... This is what I wanted. I wanted to see if I could make this square for. So, chat, the goal here is I get all these shapes down, and then I go back to whatever layer I feel like, select a color, in this case, say the roofs, and then uh, pick a slightly lighter version, 
or not really lighter so much as maybe a little more yellow if I want it to feel like it's a little midday or maybe a little make it a little more orange if I want to make it feel uh, like sunset E. Yeah, I pick one color that's slightly more the color of the light coming in and another color that's darker but on the same sort of, I guess, uh, RGB spectrum, just darker. And I use that to suggest shapes. Uh, maybe I'll do that right now, just to kind of show you what I mean. So I got this, and this is the color of that red. I keep it about there, just make it a little more orange. Yeah, let's say at about there. And then, uh, just a little lighter. And then let's make a new layer, just to be sure. Yeah, I'm going to swap colors and sample this red again. I don't know. Yeah, but that was right. Mm, actually... Alright, I'm just going to... Building shadows, put a little bit of this down, and uh, da, 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 da. then I'm gonna sample that. Yeah, let's do it this way. And uh, now that I have two of the same color, just make this, but make it. Uh... Now I'm being very inaccurate with this because I cannot for the life of me remember exactly which of these letters is just more dark but that doesn't matter so what we'll do is so this is facing north to south up and down so it's a setting in the west so this building, I feel like, is a good as one as any to show what I mean. This is very stark shadows, partially because it is very stark lines, but you know. This is also stylized, just adding some details for funsies. swap. Hmm. You know, that's a little too dark for my taste. Let's... The secret to this, and one thing that I'm not super great at, but we will see if I can get better. I'll definitely post the finished result onto our Discord when I'm actually done with this. I don't think I'm going to be able to finish it today. But uh, the goal is either do this and make sure I stay on basically the same color orange the whole time. Down to like 50. Looks a little bit like a gentle sunset, doesn't it? Could even uh, up the opacity to say, let's say, 70. Yeah, look at that. Do that on all the other buildings and it should look pretty good. We're not doing that for now. Or, uh, actually, really quick, let's. So I can save this color, let's, uh... Yeah, alright. Alright, so I have those two saved. And go away. Okay, let's go back to doing some squares. Whoop, that 
that was the wrong button. I gotta, gotta sample that red first. Yeah, there we go. Now I got it. Hmm. No chat, if this is a thing that people find enjoyable, I also do a lot of little character portraits, and mostly I doodle them. And it's another thing that gets put up on the Discord under the art sharing. Uh, I like to draw my characters, I like to draw other people's characters to get sort of a sense, a feel for them. Often when I am designing a character's backstory and life and just their whole deal, I end up liking to draw them because I find it adds a certain, I don't know, level of chaos, almost? Like it, a misstep here or just a casual shape there, and I suddenly have a uh, slightly different character than I intended. And I like that. It's a very interesting way of doing it to me. Uh, I think it was... Uh, yeah, Orson Scott Card, as much as I dislike the man's politics, has some very good advice for writing in several of his books on the subject. And he had a whole section on how he likes to draw maps of the places he's writing about. Because, yeah, little little stray pencil bits will uh, accidentally create whole story arcs or whole elements he never planned on. So, yeah, maybe one of these times I will uh, do some more serious painting of, say, the Seven Sons crew, or the uh, Night City crew. I have designed them all already, uh, so it should not be hard to do so. And that way, when we actually, like, eventually, hopefully hire a more professional artist, they will have something to work off of, and I'm sure they will be very appreciative of it. Hopefully they will be significantly better than me at things like, you know, anatomy and especially shading and color, because that's, as you may have noticed, oh boy, a thing that I am not exceptional at. But it is still entertaining to me. It's still fun, and I still think I am a decent uh, character designer when it comes to what something is, what someone is wearing, and how they're built, and how they act, uh, to sort of imply a story. Yeah, I'll come back and come back and maybe square some of these off, or maybe I'll just leave them be. It's not like. Handmade buildings are perfectly square in real life. Alright. This music from Crash Bandicoot or something? That's what this is reminding me of, and I don't know why. I didn't play a lot of that as a kid, but... Man, was it fun, the stuff I did get to play. I will square this one off, though. That's a little much. This is coming out. I say right before I undo something. I really like how this is coming out, in that I'm excited to try some of this very basic shading stuff. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that I can use these sort of orangish colors, maybe on everything, not just the uh, red. We'll see. Uh, Although I might pick the gray and then try and make it a little more yellow and a little more orange. Because I can find red and yellow on that thing. Maybe I'll uh, make it a little more red, a little more orange, and we'll, uh, I don't know, we'll see how 
it looks if I just, maybe I can just add a layer over everything once I'm done. Just a little, little orange to sort of tie it all together so it doesn't look like I've splashed random colors on the, on the thing. I can't find so we gotta find now chat and this is maybe gonna be a little harder so I have to find a good wood color a real good one one that maybe I will sample here's what I'll do chat you tell me you tell me if this is dumb I'll sample that just all right let's see let's see how I feel about oh that's not the brush let's see how I feel about this real quick and it's still kind of samey Sorry, the Kingdom Hearts music suddenly made me just stop. Man, man, I wish Kingdom Hearts had actually been good. Would have that been great if the third Kingdom Hearts game was actually like satisfying and made us feel like the story was worth all that wait? Wouldn't that have been something? I was definitely addicted to that game. I was in that relationship. I was like, oh man, this is going to be so great when the third one came out. And I just kind of ignored the fact that all the side games had been mediocre at best. I'm like, yeah, but... Yeah, but it'll be good, right? They wouldn't... They wouldn't blow the penultimate edition of this game, the final one. The one that was what we were all waiting for. They wouldn't do that. And lo and behold, that's the thing they fucking did. Maybe I shouldn't be too critical. It's not like I've made a game, but definitely feels like they made a less good game than Kingdom Hearts 2, right? Chat, you are listening, definitely, for sure. I don't know. It feels like Kingdom Hearts 2 had much larger, cooler events at the end. You got to freaking play as Riku for a little bit, the cool guy that you'd been following the whole time. The boss was freaking an epic fight that literally destroyed cities. It was everything I wanted. And the third one, Final Fight's kind of lame. Also, some the, sort of the worlds leading up to it are also kind of lame. I mean, Toy Story was fun and all, it's what we've always wanted, but... I don't know, it felt kind of empty. I mean, a lot of them felt kind of empty. Especially compared to previous games. Kingdom Hearts 2, some of the worlds felt like places that people actually lived in. But nope. None of that in our... Any of our Kingdom Hearts stuff. Not gonna happen, apparently. I don't know. Maybe I'm just bitter about it, but I really wanted that game to be good. I mean, I really wanted that game to be good. I remember when we, uh, when I moved to Utah, right at the beginning of high school, which is the worst time to move, by the way. If you ever gotta move and you got kids, try and do it before then, because uh, it's 
just the worst. Everyone already has friends. It's no fun. But anyways, we moved to Utah right at the beginning of high school. And uh, I think my dad was feeling bad about me not having friends for like multiple years. And he uh, ended up being like a little more generous than normal with like stuff that he had gotten us. Uh, he generally was more of a uh, frugal man, but I managed to managed to get some games out of him just by asking and saying, I'll work for it, and then, here you go. He got me Kingdom Hearts 2. And, uh, man, I was so obsessed with that game. I was so obsessed with the fact that that first day, literally the first day I had the game, I kept playing it when my dad told me to stop, and, uh, then he broke it. Yeah, like, after he told me, hey, you better stop playing that and get to bed, and I didn't, because I was a dumb kid, he eventually got so mad that he, uh, uh, just, he took the game and he wanted to snap it like a record. He said he had this very specific memory as a kid of uh, his dad snapping some uh, comedy record by, I don't know, Steve something rather. Dude with the white hair does a lot of Disney stuff, but apparently his comedy was extremely not safe for work. Uh, Steve something rather. Doesn't matter. Uh, he remembers his dad doing that, and he wanted to do the same thing, of just like a satisfying snap. And anyone who knows anything about PS2 game discs, it did not snap like that at all. In fact, it was kind of funny how much it did not snap. It uh, kind of did a just like a waffle, and then he tried to get it to snap twice, and he bent it again and again and again, and eventually he just kind of threw it away dejectedly. I still remember that, though, because I was like, but, 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 the game, though. It was my own damn fault, but... There's still, there's still a debate between me and my dad as to what I said, because... He's like, you better stop playing that, or I'll take it away forever. And what he heard was me saying, ugh, you're not going to take it away forever. But what, uh, I thought I said was, no, you're not going to take it away forever, are you? Question mark. Those are two very different statements. You know... I definitely uh, should not have been a little shit who was putting off bedtime at the age of 14. I still remember a lot of that about Kingdom Hearts. It was uh, weirdly tied in my memory to it. Mm -hmm. Alright, I got some boats. I got some boats, boys. You know what I'm going to do, just because it's going to make my life easier. So I'm going to make another new layer. Shipwrecks. I'm going to put that down there. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. So you see chat now. Now, if I do this, it shows up under the rocks. I'm a genius. I think I'm definitely doing a vague shape here so that when I come in with the shadows is where I'm going to get all these edges that I've done with lines. And this isn't some pretentious, real life doesn't have lines. This is a, I don't want to make clean black lines, they're annoying to make. Hmm. You know, Chad, is this stream is getting closer to ending, because I'm definitely going to uh, end at the three-hour-ish mark. But as this gets closer to ending, I'm... I, I get it. I get it why uh, artists do these kind of streams. It is kind of fun to draw and know there's people listening to you and get responses from them. You don't have to... You don't have to hear them breathing down your neck the whole time. There's a certain... something about it. Not that I wouldn't love to have y'all in my room with me, but I don't know, maybe maybe I wouldn't want someone in here while I'm drawing. I'd love to hang out with y'all, but there's something nice and relaxing about just just getting to do this. Just don't have to worry about nothing. 
And then, you know, I get to express my opinions loudly. I'm very good at that, it turns out. <laughs> if you don't know me very well, chat, I have a lot of opinions I can express very loudly all the time. One might say it's a problem. up some of these little boats. No, nope, I want this. This is a mast. It should be straight. Unlike me. into this, really, but there's a small part of me, the part of me that I shouldn't listen to, that's like, hey, are these the right kind of ships for the two cultures that are at war that you have detailed? Is that really the shape they would be? So that's the devil talking. It will get me to do research on different kinds of ships for time periods and cultures, and that would uh, take too long. That would be the worst, but it's not. Let's not chat. Can we find with Let's not? Let's not. These ships are fun. You no, know, it would be maybe fun to uh, have a co host for something like this, though. If I do character portraits, but you know, chat, you're gonna have to let me know if that's something you want. I don't know, maybe we can put up a. A thing on uh, the Discord saying, was this good? We'll see. But if it's something I do character portraits, maybe I can do, uh, I can have the person who's playing that character show up for the portrait. For the drawing. Not so that I can draw them exactly, because heaven knows I'm not good at that, but so that they can, uh, oh, what's the word? So that they can talk about the character and just, you know, also bullshit along with me. Yeah, I think that's distinct enough. Distinct enough for the large overview map. So yeah, I'm building these platforms here, and I haven't sketched them out but they're supposed to be, like, cannon placements. Uh, but I do wonder what kind of cannons. Gunpowder technically exists in this setting, but not a lot of it. I feel like it'd probably be magical. I think for the, uh... My players built an airship. Uh, they went to these uh, Thunder Elves, I think I mentioned, who are expert airship builders. Whoa. Uh, expert airship builders. And uh, they got an airship built, and they managed to make it go everywhere, but instead of a cannon, they had a ballista, and then they had a, uh, what's the word? They had what we called a lightning thrower, which was basically like stored cases of the spell lightning bolt in little crystals, and uh, anyone could put it in and aim it and shoot it out of the ship. I thought it was kind of fun. Especially because, I mean, you look at the damage cannons and lightning bolts do. Lightning bolts do more, kind of, but I just nerfed the damage a little, made it a placement. And suddenly it was a very flavorful uh, airship weapon for these elves that live in the endless storm on Thoron's trench. It was, uh... It was good. I liked it. It was very good. Now... I do 
want to finish this thing. What kind of what kind of tiles? What kind of what kind of bullshit? What kind of... Maybe a gray wood. Yeah, let's go with that. Now, I sure hope other people are watching since we only got two viewers, but we have a bunch of people in chat. I don't really know what the difference is. I'll have to ask. I'll have to ask Spree or Dan or Joe, who are just a little more experienced with this sort of thing. was the last person to really interact. I know y'all are lurking, and I'm happy for it. I just don't know what two viewers and, uh, what's it, how many users in chat? Nine users in chat, 10, 11. 11 users in chat, two moderators, and the broadcaster. Count me as a user? I actually don't have it open, I just am using it through Streamlabs. You know, chat, I think maybe I did the shading wrong. I think I know what I'm going to do, actually, when I get to it. When I get to that building shading, I'm going to get a color wheel out. And I will find the orange I want for the sunset, something real vibrant. Uh, maybe a little bit of yellow in there. And then I will find the opposite bluish color on that color wheel. At least I believe it will be bluish. And I will use that for the shadows, and I'll use the orange for the highlights, and I'll put that all in its own layer for the whole thing, and then maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, bleed that out a little, and make it opaque a bit. I'll probably have to be quite opaque, actually, but yeah, I'll make that opaque, and then probably, eh, probably uh, some color adjustment to that layer. It's funny enough that that's something I'm more confident in in Photoshop than I am color theory, because my job is somewhat demanded that I figure that figure that out. Not this job, actually, that I have now. Uh, I used to work for a marketing company that handled other people's stuff. At the time, I handled the live chat for like 300 nursing homes at once. That was interesting. <laughs> What color would honeycomb be? I think it'll be a little more in the yellow. Because, yeah, that's, that's what this big circular thing is. It's basically a big hive. But it's not actually honeycomb. I feel like... I don't know, humans like greens and blues? Maybe bee people will like kind of yellows. Alright, now, how do I feel about... Well, first of all... Blending in a little, but I mean, it's not right next to it. Maybe it's fine. Er. Mm. First of all, now that that layer is gone, I do need to square you off a bit. that lighter but more yellow. How's that look? Still not great. No, we'll go with that. That's maybe too loud. Maybe it's weird for a building. 
But you know what? I am ready to be done for the day, and I will revisit that shit later. Low key chat, I might also revisit shading later after I've done the other uh, parts of the map I need to. Maybe I should get the shapes down that are critical first, you know? Uh, for all three maps that I'm doing. I say only three, but one of them has like four stories. I may be a little deep. That's fine. It's fine. That is just fine. platform. Just a little platform. Let's read the sketch layer one last time today. And just whoop. Whoop, that's the new sound effect. If anyone's listening, you should meme it. Just fully do the memeing. One more thing, chat, and then I'm out. I am done for the day. Hmm. Oh, interesting. to just do this to one or two buildings. Because I don't really want to spend a lot of time right now, but this way I can kind of save it. Alright, let's just do it over here. Switch layer. Yeah. I'll put just some uh, A little, little uh, iron working, just to give it a little bit of shape. This will be faster. This thing of front and back the way I want it. I could do to make this wood look like wood panels, but I'm not I'm not doing that today. Okay, let's uh, let's give this building a weather vane. Huh? Let's say it's a whoop and a whoop, and there's just like the little. Oh well, that didn't really work the way I wanted it to. Just, just little, little touches, little touches. Now that it's mostly done in big shapes, it's those little touches that are gonna actually make the difference. But yeah. I don't know. I think that looks all right. I'll definitely add more. 
add a little more details just to make it feel a little more like a real map of a real place. But that's mostly it. That's mostly it. Well, I'm gonna. Oh. I'm gonna save this. Actually, that's a big thing I should have been doing. Uh, I'll do that real quick before we leave. This is erstwhile island map. So let's make a That is saved. That is saved and done. Alrighty, chat. Alrighty, alrighty. Let's go back. Well, thank you guys for joining me, for being around and watching me just doodle on Photoshop. Well, we'll see how this goes in the future. I don't know. I, I did enjoy it. I enjoyed having you guys around to yap at. Uh, Next time, maybe we'll do maps, maybe we'll do character stuff, or maybe we'll just do more video games. We'll see. Uh, my name's Tate Washburn. You can find me at kinda underscore writing. Let's uh, just get that command in there. If Nightbot's gonna work. I don't really remember how any of that works. Oh, that's right, I gotta... There it is. You can find me at kinda, kinda underscore writing on Twitter. Uh, you can also find us here at... Uh, Neon Lights are play. Uh, Nightbot has posted it a few times, so you should be sure to find it. You can find it us on our Discord. And uh, yeah, tomorrow we're going to be doing... Uh, which ones are we doing? We're doing Seven Suns. I'm in that. I should have remembered. We're doing Seven Suns. And uh, we'll see you then. Bye.